Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, there was a nice commercial. I, um, I don't want to talk um, so much about, uh, I don't want to think of this so much as a uh, commercial or a um, pitch for SAP as sharing with all of you um, some of my experiences and, and observations. Um, Wish told me to put a pop culture reference in there in the speech. I couldn't think of one. Um, I'm not much of a pop culture guy. But um, Thai obviously means um, a lot to all of us um, in the valley. And uh, over the last 22 or so years that I have been here, Thai has been a tremendous institution um, that has helped us all. And today, in particular, it is also a distinct um, honor for me to be here. Dr. Chopra is here, uh, one of the great teachers of our lives. And uh, um, it was very humbling to see he, he showed up at the, at the front of the hotel to, to pick me up. And that was quite extraordinary. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. Thanks for everything uh, that you have taught all of us. So I simply want to share with you uh, five observations, things that I have learned, picked up along the way. Um, through three series of experiences uh, at, at Stanford as a student, then at two startups, and uh, over the last 10 years at SAP. The first one is, people always ask me, um, being the, the head of technology at a large software company, well, what is Vishal, what's going on? I mean, this is the most common question that I get asked is, what do you see happening around us? And um, I mean, I think the big thing that is happening around us is that it has now become um, increasingly clear that software is, uh, that bits, digital artifacts are replacing physical artifacts at a really alarming, uh, in a very visceral and a dramatic way. Uh, you can see examples of this. Here are examples of um, artifacts that have all basically become digital and to a large extent disappeared into, um, um, into bits. You can see the, the picture that stopped rolling is the picture of the uh, Gutenberg press, the printer. About four or 500 years ago, right there in the middle is this beautiful HP calculator. Um, all of these things have been replaced by, uh, by bits. The Gutenberg printer was a very interesting printer. Today, everybody in the valley is celebrating the IPO of Facebook. Um, if you think about it, the Gutenberg made that printer about a little bit more than, uh, I would say about 400 or so years ago, if my math is not wrong. Um, <clears throat> up until that point, printing used to be the uh, privilege of, of the church, basically. And uh, you would write something, and then the church could choose to print it, the people who knew how to do the, operate the, the printers in those days. Um, and you had basically no control over what was being printed because the people who had the control of the printer could choose to edit what you had. So in many ways, the Gutenberg printer was not so much about uh, making printing available to everybody, but it was more about making it possible for us to express whatever was on our minds and be able to print it and share it the way we wanted to. And this ability to express, uh, opening up of the ability to express is something that technology has been doing for centuries. Um, in 1776, the year that America was born, uh, Tom Paine wrote the Common Sense Manifesto. And it was a two-page or so document uh, articulating what a democracy was. And um, it was printed on a printer pretty much like the Gutenberg printer. Um, and in one year, it reached 900,000 colonists in America within one year. It was printed, three it had three different printings. And uh, now remember that at the time, there were only one and a half million colonists in the entire 13 colonies. That means that the Common Sense Manifesto made its way to roughly three quarters or two thirds to three quarters of the population within one year. When you talk about the viral spread of Facebook today, reaching maybe 10% of humanity, it is interesting to keep in mind that 240 years ago, a document made its way to three quarters of a population. 
within one year. So social networking was not invented uh, by, by Facebook. The, uh, so this notion of bits being replaced by atoms is a continuous, uh, is a continuous value creation of technology. And um, we are tempted to think that layers dissolve and uh, structures dissolve and that value is lost. But in the grander scheme of things, if good things continue to happen, um, value continues to be added. A lot of bookstores have been, uh, have been disappearing recently, have been replaced by digital things inside Kindle and these kinds of devices. Um, however, the, we are not reading any less. In fact, we are reading as much or even more than we ever were. I see many of you are hunched back, probably tweeting or reading emails or whatever. Um, we are reading much more than we ever were. And this cycle of people connecting to each other with better technology, that connectedness disintermediating layers in between, um, and that forcing and increasing ease of use by at the endpoints is something that has been going on for quite some time. Some more examples of this. Here is this really amazing app. It's called Awesome Eyes. Um, it is, I think, made by Smug Mug or one of these photo sharing companies. But what I find very cool about it is that it has all these features that used to be available for professionals. My, my dad used to have a, a dark room in our house in, in India growing up, and he used to take pictures. And it used to be very painstaking for him to put filters on the pictures and uh, make things look interest, with interesting colors and so forth. And then on this app, you can press a button and, um, and, and bring all these professional photographer style capabilities right inside the iPhone. So those services that were physical services have disappeared. Here is an even more exa uh, stark example of services that have disappeared. On the left-hand side, you see a, a very large printing press um, with all kinds of machines and complex things. And on the right-hand side is a 3D printer, which basically uh, prints the same kinds of things. And uh, here is a picture of a flute, a professional musician level uh, flute that was used in a concert that was actually printed entirely on a 3D printer. It's another example of physical things disappearing um, into information. On the backs of that, I believe that we see a tremendous sense of end users empowering themselves. We talk about bring your own device, people signing up for cloud services on their own, uh, the Arab uprising and the protests that have been happening around us and, uh, and so forth. But the real story underneath is that digital technology and software is making it possible for end users to do their own thing far more than was ever possible before. The other thing, when you look at the news these days and, and what is going on in Europe, for example, and uh, I, I am a board member of a company that is headquartered in Europe. Um, we are in particular watching this very closely. And you get a sense of a tremendous uh, turmoil around us. And the way I see it, um, I was talking to Dr. Chopra about this last night. At the heart of this issue is the fact that um, earlier this year, the United Nations published a report saying that basically the world needs 600 million new jobs over the next 10 years. 600 million people, additional new jobs, have to be created into the world over the next 10 years. And that is the heart of the issue. And you know the way things are set up. Of course, democracy is the best form of government that we have. We haven't invented one that is better as Winston Churchill once said. Um, but the heart of the issue that nobody seems to be tackling is that 600 million people need to find meaningful jobs. And I believe that here in the Valley, when we think about the broader scheme of things, we have to consider the possibility that innovations that we create end up creating these additional jobs and bring more people into the workforce. And finally, the third thing I believe that is becoming increasingly clear is as complex systems become transformed by software, become transformed by digital technology, become replaced by software, we have to better understand software. Um, as a lifelong software guy, my sense is that 
our understanding of complex software is still very primitive. Um, we don't understand complex software system to the level that we understand other complex systems. Um, my wife is here and um, her uncle used to work in Washington DC for an organization in the government called 10 Years Hence. And I once asked him when I came to, when I, after we got married, when I first met him, what does, it, what does it mean to do 10 years hence? And he said, the 10 years hence group looks at how Washington DC will be like 10 years later. And I said, wow, that is interesting. Uh, and he said, yeah, there is also a group called 25 years hence. There is a group called 50 years hence. Um, and these people sit there and they plan and think about urban planning and what the cities will be like. Uh, and you can, you, know, you can go into Santa Clara County and they will tell you what kind of roads they are anticipating over the next 10 years um, and 25 years. And, uh, and so forth. And, and I walk into IT landscapes, massively complex IT landscapes. We have Daimler, for example, which is one of our big customers, has nearly 200 ERP systems that they run around the world. Uh, and they have 10 million lines of custom code that they have written in ERP software from SAP. 10 million lines of custom code. Um, Anand Krishnan, the CTO of uh, TCS, is a friend of mine. And he told me once that uh, the lines of COBOL code in the world is increasing by about 5%. Um, our understanding of complex software systems is quite primitive. And this needs to change, especially as we become more and more dependent on software. The second thing I want to talk about is just learnings that I have seen. Uh, this is something that uh, Vish was particularly keen that I share with all of you. Um, the, the three parts of my last, my adult life, uh, the first one was at Stanford. And um, now that I look back on my five years at Stanford uh, doing a PhD, the um, big thing I remember is learning how to think. Uh, learning how to think in an incredibly unstructured environment. As a PhD student, you have to basically learn to think and solve problems um, pretty much without any guidance or without any boundaries. And it sounds very liberating and it sounds like fun, but after a year or two, you realize it is incre incredibly difficult. Um, and taming that challenge uh, turns out to be the biggest thing that you remember 20 years later after you have forgotten all the theorems you proved and all the software you wrote and all the other things that you did in the course of that journey. Um, following startup, Stanford, I did two startups and many of the Thai charter members, I saw Raj, Raj Parekh here earlier. Where is Raj? He's somewhere in the audience. Uh, he was one of the investors in my startup. He's right there. Um, and you quickly learn about um, the three dimensions of design thinking in the startup, whether you like it or not, that the success of the startup depends on the desirability, how well the products, the services that you make are liked by your end users, the feasibility, how, how well equipped you are from an engineering point of view, from a construction point of view, from a uh, competence point of view, to build that thing that your end users find desirable, and the viability, which is perhaps the one that most startups fail on, is the commercial success, the commercial need, the uh, financial um, basis of success of the product. And finally, over the last 10 years, and perhaps the most, um, most present of my experiences, um, working for a company that was founded 40 years ago. I, I joined SAP when we were celebrating 30 years, and this year we are celebrating our 40 years. Um, a 40-year-old company becomes incredibly rooted in its success, um, especially a company like SAP that has seen tremendous success. Uh, our R3 software pretty much changed the face of, um, of enterprise, of businesses in the 90s. And, um, when you have that much success for a sustained period of time, you realize that um, you become a victim of that success. Um, about three years ago, in early 2009, my boss, um, our founder and chairman, Hasso Plattner, took me to dinner one time, and he said that, Vishal, you have to help SAP renew it, intellectually renew itself. You have to help lead the intellectual renewal of SAP. And for a long time, 
to be honest, I did not understand what that meant. Um, how do you renew a company of 50,000 employees? And, um, and I, I realized that after about six months of thinking about it, I realized that it, it must be done on the basis of products, amazing, innovative products. And uh, you cannot philosophize about intellectual renewal. You cannot create a committee that is going to lead the intellectual renewal. You cannot create a process or a governance framework for intellectual renewal, that these are the intellectual renewal guys. It must be something that is done on the basis of innovation. And, uh, and not only in the products that you build and their success, but how you build them, the, the process, the methodology that you use to bring that innovation to life. And uh, I joined the board of SAP in 2010. And I would say, since then, we have been treating the whole company basically like a 40-year-old startup. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of people who work in SAP as if we have the intensity, the uh, mindset, the narrow window of opportunity that a startup would face when facing extreme circumstances um, and extreme shortage. And what we have been doing in those years, the basis of our work is these three things that I want to briefly talk about. One is timeless software. That if you have been remarkably successful in something and customers are totally dependent on it, and now you want to renew yourself, you must be able to renew customer landscapes without disruption. And this notion of renewal without disruption is extremely important. I mentioned earlier the cities, uh, complex institutions like cities or bridges or airplanes, they always continuously renew themselves without disruption. I mean, uh, Banaras is a city that has been around for thousands of years. We don't even know how many years. Uh, you look at a city like Delhi or, or a city like, like Paris or, or New York, is it an old city or a new city? Uh, and the answer, of course, is, is it is both. Uh, New York is simultaneously a very modern, thriving, young city, and it is centuries old. Um, software systems don't evolve like this. We always have these trade-offs that people tell us between disruption and innovation, that either you get innovation, but then you disrupt yourself, or you stay with the same crap that you have, uh, but then you miss out on the innovation. And I think that um, we have to learn, and I call this thing timeless software, this notion that complex systems must evolve without disruption. And we have been working on that. Every product that SAP builds um, for the last several years and onwards is based on this principle of non-disruption. Last year, SAP did a radical thing. We extended the maintenance contract on our core ERP product until 2020, which people thought that, my goodness, um, and that is based on the confidence that we have that we can renew ourselves without disruption. That no matter what, we don't know what will be the cool innovations five years from now, but we know that no matter what they are, we will bring them into the current software without disruption. And, and there are other elements to that around how you interface and how do you overlay interfaces onto these systems um, so that you can attach other new things and so forth. Um, the second thing we have been doing, I think many of you might have heard about this, is this little baby that we have created called HANA, um, which is this uh, amazing in-memory database. Uh, we have been rethinking the notion of databases with HANA, uh, and we have been rethinking the notion of programming with, uh, with a project that we have called River. Um, HANA, just to give you a little bit of an um, update and information on this, uh, HANA was launched about a year ago, in June of last year. It's a uh, built from the ground up in-memory database, um, which takes advantage of the massive, massive power of modern hardware. Um, today, right here in Santa Clara, Intel manufactures um, a 10-core processor called Westmere. Starting in June next year, the Sandy Bridge processor will be out, which is an, uh, which is an even faster and cheaper and better power-consuming processor. And with these processors, you can get a, a single server with 80 cores on it uh, and two terabytes of main memory and as much SSD or, or, or disk as you want to persist things. But 80 cores of processing and, and um, 
two terabytes of main memory in a box about that high is an unbelievable amount of power. And what HANA does is rethinks the um, notion of a database, keeping in mind that modern hardware and hardware for the future is going to be multi-core, large memory, flash-oriented hardware. And what can you do to rethink the way data can be processed? It has been an incredible success. Um, we made 200 million euro uh, of uh, re license revenue in one year um, with a product that non-disruptively attaches to existing landscapes and dramatically accelerates them. More than 350 customers have purchased this. Um, just to keep in mind, 200 million euro in one year is the fastest growing product in our history. Probably in the history of enterprise software, nothing has been launched that in one year made more than 200 million euro in revenue. Uh, that's about $270 million roughly. Um, and um, here is some uh, more information on it. We are able to analyze um, dramatically large amounts of information on a 16 node cluster of IBM servers, standard Intel x86 IBM servers. We can take 100 terabytes of data and analyze that within 300 to 500 milliseconds um, and do any kinds of complex multidimensional ad hoc query on it in between 800 milliseconds and two seconds without caching, without materializing views, without indexing things and so forth. So it is really um, unprecedented performance on analytics, but also on the transactional side, we are able to do inserts of 770,000 records per second. Those of you who are not in the, in the database world, enterprise software world, this is a, uh, pretty much a revolution. Um, here is an example of a machine that sits right here in, in Santa Clara. Um, Raj, in fact, helped us with this. Um, 100 IBM X5 servers. It is this machine that you see a picture of here. It's uh, 17 racks. It's 100 terabytes of DRAM and 4,000 CPU cores. And the entire machine cost us um, $4 million to put together. This is about, IBM, even though IBM helped us build this, this is about 10 times the size of Watson. Um, and you can pretty much, we can take the 10 largest ERP systems that we run in the world and run them all entirely on this one cluster of $4 million. So there is a dramatic, dramatic advance that is possible with modern hardware, and this is something that we are bringing um, to the world of, uh, of software. And the benefits that customers see in this are, and this is something that the human brain finds difficult to comprehend. Um, what I mean here by the 10,000 club is those companies have run something or the other on HANA that runs 10,000 times faster than it runs today on their productive environment. Um, the way our brains are wired, we find it difficult to imagine a 10,000 times performance improvement. Um, even if I said something like the SR group that is mentioned there, they take a complex report in understanding the costs and profitability of their projects. This is a very large construction company in India. And this used to take 18 hours to run before, and it happens now in four seconds. That is a performance improvement of 15,000 times. Um, 15,000 times, and so all these companies, and there are, these are just the ones that we know about uh, that are running something 10,000 times faster on HANA. There are two companies up there, Yodobashi and Mitsui, both in Japan, that run something 100,000 times faster. Um, and our ability to, to put a span on what a 100,000 times performance improvement is is quite limited. I use examples like if you were to walk from here to New York, um, to be 10,000 times faster than that, you would have to cover the same distance in six minutes. Um, and, um, but you know, somehow, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible value that you increase when you are able to rethink how data can be processed. Um, so that's what we have been working on, and then I see that I am running out of time. The uh, fourth thing, that I feel is extremely important for us to think about. I see more and more in the mindset of the young people that come into, into the workforce today that they look for a purpose. It's a very encouraging thing. Um, 
It is not only enough these days for a lot of our new colleagues to work on things um, just to make, make a paycheck, but to have it mean something. And we have been really focused on that. Um, we have been thinking about this. Also in rethinking how we have our spaces, the areas that we work in, our offices and things like that. So we started this initiative called the App House, where we here are pictures of the four app houses that we have built. Um, our thinking was basically that intellectual renewal of a large company was not only about um, the products that we are working on, but also about how we work. And you see these are four kinds of spaces that you would find in Silicon Valley in pretty much any startup company with IKEA furniture and so forth. We started in Los Altos. I have eight buildings in Palo Alto uh, where the SAP offices are located. Uh, but for this particular team, they wanted to have a work environment of a startup. And so they got space in downtown Los Altos as if they were a startup. And ironically, um, it, it, has, it has IKEA furniture and things like that. And ironically, it is cheaper from a facilities point of view for us to maintain this facility than our own buildings, which, is, which was uh, a very interesting uh, lesson to us. So we have been growing these app houses everywhere. Uh, we started one in Bangalore. You see that there, one in Shanghai, one in our team in, uh, in Dublin. And uh, it has been, the feedback that we get from, from people is, is amazing. People find it more fun to work in an environment like this. You get better, uh, better talent. Um, people work longer uh, and just, they're just happier. Um, they are more open, they are more communicative, uh, they are more collaborative. Uh, working across teams is much easier in an environment that is more conducive uh, to openness. And uh, so this has been quite an interesting experience. And we have also been building products that you would not traditionally think about a company like SAP building. And uh, one is this product that we have built called Recalls Plus. It is an application for young parents, um, moms uh, in particular, who want to watch for recalls on products that affect their children's lives. Um, car seats, baby food, you know, seat belts, things like that. Um, we launched this application on the Apple Store on February 15th. And as of today, I, I get a daily report on this. Um, we have 32,000 uh, people who, have, who are using this application in 90 days, which is, of course, the fastest growth that any SAP product has ever had in terms of end user adoption. Uh, 32,000 people, and we have spent less than $1,000 on marketing this. Um, of course, I talk about it at events like this, so probably now, hopefully, another 600, 700 of you will go and download this thing. Um, but um, people wonder, you know, why is this seems like a toy? Why is SAP building an application for moms um, that is free on the Apple Store? Well, first of all, of course, moms find it extremely useful. Uh, they want to know if there is a recall on a product that affects them. But the other interesting thing is that Pretty much all the manufacturers whose products these are, are our customers. Um, the CIO of Nestle had once told me that, and that was the inspiration for building this app in the first place, that until a few years ago, Nestle used to have a recall somewhere in the world once every two weeks, on average. And they spent hundreds of millions of euros to improve that process, and now they have a recall once every three weeks. So again, going back to this connectedness and layers dissolving and end users becoming more empowered, if you had the ability to communicate directly with an end user, instead of going through the various chains of logistics and retail and so forth, and communicate with them openly and, and honestly about recalls of your products, everybody's lives get better. Um, obviously the consumer, but also the manufacturer who is able to react to this immediately. And I spoke to one of our customers um, in the consumer industry, which manufactures dog food. And they had this scare last year when the tainted dog food came from China, um, that they had to immediately reach people, because there was poison in the dog food. Uh, they had to immediately reach people. Uh, and if they had an app like this that was directly connected to the consumers, 
they would have been able to much better deal with things like this. So what we learned was, and Sam and Sanjay and the team who are here, they are the ones who built this app, that it is possible to build an app that completely rethinks everything that you do, um, and, and yet is a better business in doing so. And Deepak has a very interesting notion of this that he calls just capital, and I believe you will talk about this uh, later today. Uh, and here is another one. Pretty much all the, uh, one of the most um, commonly deployed application that SAP has is financials within ERP. And almost all big companies in the world use our financial software. And yet when you think about it, whenever there is a great need uh, in the world around us, uh, a flood somewhere or a earthquake somewhere, uh, do we really have an, a, an ability to connect them in a kind of a social commercial network instantly, where the transaction on the flow of money and goods and services can be instantly coordinated? And the answer is no, we are hopelessly bad at that today. Um, so we started this community called Charitra, um, which is of course Charitra, the, the Sanskrit word, but also a short form for a, a charity transformation, a charity transformed, uh, where people can just go and publish needs and publish things that they are willing to do. And uh, we have done, we are still uh, working on this, on this community, this is called projectcharitra.sap.com. And um, without any word of mouth, without any, without any talking about this, we will, at some point when we are ready, we will talk about this uh, to the world. But even without any of that, more than 10,000 people have showed up on this community and, um, and are participating and, and asking for things and giving things and so forth. And, um, and this has been an extraordinary experience. So we learned that it is possible not only to continue to do justice to the shareholders and, and the financial returns, but in fact, do something purposeful and worthwhile um, in doing so. So finally, I think that the second, one of the five most commonly asked questions that I get is, what is the secret? What is the difference between working at a startup or a university or a big company? And the answer is there isn't pretty much any difference. When you are having fun, you are working equally hard no matter what you do and no matter where you are. Um, so the lesson in all of that is that it is always a good idea to follow our instincts, to follow our passion. And uh, a, a good measure of whether you are doing the right thing or not is are you having fun? Um, it's a, usually an undersubscribed notion, an undersubscribed KPI, if you will, of measuring our, our success, but having fun is usually a great one. Um, Vish had asked me to put a pop culture reference, and I, I don't watch that many Hindi movies, but there is this one song um, from the movie Kamine. I don't know if many of you have heard this. I don't know if, how many of you can read this on the right hand side. Oh, plenty of you. Uh, this is a line, a beautiful line from the song, Jo soe hai khabro mein unko jagana nahi. It means uh, those, those people who are asleep in the news, don't wake them up. And I think today it is especially interesting. There are a lot of people asleep watching the Facebook IPO and reading news about it instead of creating some value or doing something meaningful. I think it is interesting. One of the lessons that I have fundamentally learned is that it is always a good idea to not chase after fads, but instead follow your instinct and, and do your own thing. There are some amazingly complex, purposeful problems that are waiting to be solved. Um, I had a, I was in India uh, two months ago, and I had a visit with the, um, the chairman of the ICICI Bank, Mr. Kamat, and he told me an, an unbelievable statistic. Uh, he said that 800 million people in India don't have a bank account. Uh, 800 million people, only 20% of the people have a bank account. Uh, and he sees that with this Aadhaar project that brings an identity to everybody in India and uh, by the way, the Aadhaar people have been doing an unbelievable job. They add one and a half million new Aadhaar identities every day. Uh, and already I think close to 200 million people have an identity for the first time ever. Um, so you imagine 800 million people banking uh, on their phones, asking for their bank account status and making deposits and withdrawals and asking for credit. These kinds of systems are extremely dynamic, 
um, low cost kinds of systems. We don't have today um, the software platforms to solve these kinds of problems. We have solved problems for the high end complex kinds of things that banks look for, um, operational algorithmic trading and um, risk calculations and so forth. And despite that, of course, you know, you saw what happened in the global banking system. But um, what would be very interesting is to bring modern technology, like this HANA um, in memory technology that I talked about. These kinds of things are necessary to bring basic payment, credit, banking services to hundreds of millions of people. Um, or you look at healthcare around the world. Today, it takes about uh, in the US, here in the Valley, at Stanford and so forth, it takes about 30 days um, and um, many, many thousands of dollars to get your genome sequenced. And um, if you think about it, from the time that the tissue sample or the blood sample is taken to the time that the genome is fully sequenced and interpreted, um, this 30 days is not necessary. Uh, and 30 days actually is a very long time if a person is diagnosed with cancer your life is pretty much done. You go through five or six chemotherapies in a month and your life is irrevocably altered. But structurally, once the tissue sample is taken, this is basically an information processing problem. There is no reason for this to take 30 days. Why can't the analysis and the sequencing and the interpretation be done while the patient is sitting with the doctor? Um, this should be doable. We should be able to do this. I don't know if many of you have a parent who is on a dialysis machine. Uh, if you have seen how ghastly this dialysis procedure is, it is a 70-year-old refrigerator-like machine that they attach to an open blood supply in the body, and then the whole blood gets recycled in three hours. It is a, a ghastly procedure. Sitting here in the valley, we should be able to do better than that. Um, my sense is that there are some really fundamental problems that are in front of us that, uh, that we should be able to apply modern technology to, and, um, and yet be an amazing, financially rewarding, successful business in doing that. And if you ask me for one thing that I would like to ask the people at Thai, it would be that let us stop wasting our time on things that don't add any value, and let's go do something purposeful with our lives. Thank you very much. Hey, Robert. Great to see you. Thanks. Now, I'm going to dive straight into it. Um, I, I travel around the world a lot. I've been to about 70 countries. And everywhere I go, I meet successful, brainy Indians, um, people like Dr. Sikha, people like you people. And, and frankly, I think you're responsible for the, the stereotype that people have about Indians in this country. I don't know if you read the. Um, the, the cartoon Dilbert, where they have that character Asok, who studied at the uh, Indian Institutes of Technology. But I mean, you know, to sum up what he's like um, when he wants to uh, heat his uh, cup of coffee, rather than putting it in the microwave, he sort of holds it to his forehead and <laughs> imagines flames. <laughs> now, Vishal, I'm not going to ask you to heat a cup of coffee with um, your thoughts, but I am going to ask you some questions. Now, it seems to me, um, you're, you're a perfect example of this, this breed of global Indian. You know, you were born in India, um, you were educated in America, and you're working for a German company with operations in 126 countries. Um, it seems to me that uh, th there's an awful lot going on there. Um, I want to get to just a sense of where you're coming from. Now, you, you tell a story about how um, your, your father worked for the railways in India. Um, and you took him to see the uh, high-speed train in Germany, and he was completely gobsmacked by, by how good it was. I wonder if you can tell me just very briefly something about what, what growing up in India um, taught you, how that helped you become the, the, the high-tech man you are today. Um, I think that uh, there is a sense of respect for traditions um, that, at least in my generation, that we had growing up in India. And, uh, you not only learn to respect traditions, I mean, things like recycling that started here in the US relatively late uh, are, are, used to be a given when we were growing up. Uh, there is a, a sense of respect for resources, uh, a respect for 
the, the mathematical and the sciences, um, which we grew up with, and that was quite fascinating. Um, the train example is another one of these amazing examples. Um, when I was growing up, my dad used to take me inside a, one of those steam locomotives, and you had this, the driver and a foreman, and the driver was, there were literally four, five hundred knobs inside the, the locomotive that they would constantly be turning while talking to you. Um, and every once in a while, the foreman would put the coal inside the thing and so forth. And then in today's trains, if you go to the ICE in Germany or the TGV in France, you see that basically the driver is just sitting there smoking a cigarette and the train <laughs> is going at 300 kilometers per hour with just a few buttons on the, on the display. And it's completely safe. It's completely safe. It is yeah. far safer than, of course, the, the systems from 40, 50 years ago. It's a great example of how layers dissolve uh, over time. But I think that that requires a deeper understanding of the underlying sciences and mathematics uh, and engineering, which, uh, which helps us a lot um, growing up in India. Absolutely. Now, it's, it's my observation that we're, we're living in a, an age of, of migration at the moment. A lot of particularly the brainy people um, are moving uh, furiously, frantically around the world. I mean, I, I asked the, the head of Tata Consulting Services once what proportion of his top people had either studied um, or worked overseas. And, and he looked at me like that was a stupid question. He said, well, all of them, all of, of them. course. Yeah. Now, you're, you're, you're working for uh, this, this company where you, you do research in, in Germany, um, in, in America and in India. Could, could you tell us something about how you, get, how you get the brains in those three different places to talk to each other? The, um, when we have, uh, SAP is run by five board members and um, all five of us are in different parts of the world on any given day. Until day before yesterday, we were all together in Orlando, which was a very rare thing that all five of us were together in Orlando. Um, and now today I had a call with one of them in the morning um, we are all in five different parts of the world. And, um, and I think it is a tremendous strength. I think um, when I talked about HANA, uh, this product was built by a team literally around the world, uh, engineers in Korea. So the day would start in Korea, a little bit in Shanghai, India, Israel, Germany, and then back here in California. And each team would span two time, two time zones. Uh, so you would basically work two shifts. So the and sun would never set the sun would on never this set. scheme, a bit like yeah. the British Empire of old, but maybe a yeah. bit more innovative. Yeah, exactly. And, and so communication technology helps a lot. We have telepresence systems built by Cisco right here, um, which help. It, it is an extraordinary benefit to have uh, teams around the world. And what keeps them together? I think great goals keep them together. No matter where people are, an inspiring, amazing challenge to go do something incredible Mm -hmm. uh, inspires people the same way, no matter where you are around the world. Mm -hmm. And the challenge to build a database that was a, going to be 100,000 times faster than today's databases mm -hmm. was a pretty incredible goal to go after, and I think you can motivate pretty much anybody on that. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference in the approach to innovation from, for example, your, your Indian engineers um, in Bangalore and the ones in Silicon Valley? Yeah. The, um, the basic training is the same, the uh, technologies and tools they use are the same, but the mindset is totally different. Um, the expertise in certain areas is, is totally different. I find that, um, generally speaking, the attitude of people in the more uh, developed countries, the more you know, US and, and Western Europe and so forth, uh, to embrace uh, really incredible challenges. If you just throw an absurd challenge at somebody that you have to do this kind of a thing in three days, when something typically would have taken an army of people uh, an year to do that. Uh, a, an engineer in India or China is much more mentally open to something bizarre and absurd like that mm -hmm. um, than a traditional uh, engineer. But I don't know why that is. That is an interesting mm -hmm. of, a phenomenon that we have observed. And of course, that leads to interesting strategies in hiring and the kinds of tasks that you assign to different places and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but by and large, you know, engineers, capable engineers, capable technical people or managers uh, are, are the same everywhere. We are motivated by the same kinds of things. We are inspired by the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but but what's, what's different today compared to, say, you know, 20 years ago is that it's much easier for these people to talk to each other. Yes. It's much easier for them to, to meet each other. Yeah. And, uh, particularly, um, you know, when, when you have people moving from one country to another, I mean, you know, 
clever people moving around the world are a bit like uh, you know blood cells in the human bloodstream, just sort of right. distributing ideas like uh, like the blood cells would distribute oxygen and food. I mean, do you do you, do you worry that? Um, a lot of politicians out there don't really get that. I yeah. mean, we hear a lot of talk at the moment, a lot of worry about uh, people wanting to close borders and, and, and slow the flow of, uh, of talent across yeah. borders. Is that something that affects your business? Um, yeah, of course, uh, if, if that happens, it will affect all businesses, including ours, in a very significant way. But I think it is, it is absurd, it will never happen. The, uh, we have moved irrevo irrevocably to a point where the flow of talent, the flow of information across boundaries is, is inevitable. It, is, mm -hmm. it will happen. It cannot be stopped. Um, compared to 20 years ago, I would say that uh, our ability to have a fine-grained communication mm -hmm. is dramatically better now than it was 20 years ago. So the outcome of that used to be that you would have much more well-defined, large-scale tasks that you would perform mm -hmm. um, you know, in different places. Now you can actually literally have a project that is shared between teams around the world, and much more fine-grained activities can be coordinated, which makes it much more uh, advantageous to do things in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. This was not the case before. But I mean, there are, there are quite serious discussions. I mean, where I come from in Britain, the government has got a, a, a serious idea that they want to put an absolute cap on the number of foreign students who come to British universities, which, yeah. is, which is insane. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's like as if you were to go to Boeing and say, we're going to um, put a, a cap on the number of airplanes that you can sell to foreigners. Yes. You know, I mean, universities, not only are they a big export industry, but they're also a way that you get you know, clever people to come together, to swap ideas, and, and to develop an a understanding of, 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 of different countries. Yeah. I, mean, no, I think that this is, uh, it is just, um, entities and organizations that don't understand the underlying realities that are at play here. And uh, my sense is that even if some ill-informed, ill-advised decisions like this get taken, yeah. they are pretty quickly reversed. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is just an inevitable flow of um, evolution of things mm -hmm. that people are um, going to be around the world and working openly. Uh, there is just not, there's nothing that's going to change that. Um, it is only a matter of time before the pockets of resistance to this also disappear. The important thing is, of course, there is locality and there are benefits to locality. There is yeah. still, despite the amazing qualities of telepresence and other communication technologies, there is no substitute to sitting together in person. So locality has its benefits, yeah. but you can organize your teams to be local mm -hmm. um, in order to serve, uh, in order to serve the, the task at hand. Okay. Um, a final question then. There's. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of worry about India at the moment. There's, there's, there's worry over things like the, the big scandal over the issuing of the mobile telephone licenses that then had to be revoked, over the retroactive taxes on, on Vodafone, over sort of inconsistent decisions like one minute saying that foreign supermarkets are allowed to operate uh, in India and the next minute saying they're not. Um, AJ Piramal recently said in the Wall Street Journal that he worried that there was a sort of anti-business um, environment uh, coming. Do you, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I, I, uh, every time I go to India, I, I make maybe four trips a year. Um, my sense is that India goes on independent or regardless of what happens um, in these uh, governing... By and large, the movement of India, the flow of India, this is governed by the citizenry, which pretty much um, does the right things despite the, uh, you know, whatever the governments are that are uh, in charge. So, I mean, I, I find, and one of the distinct differences that I find between people in, in China, for example, and people in India, is that in India there is a lot more openness, and even it is more chaotic and less organized, but there is a lot more openness to innovation and creativity. In China, things are much more organized and, mm. and driven according to plans and so forth, and they are both equally impressive, mm. um, but totally different. Um, you know. mm -hmm. So my sense is, regardless of uh, whether there is a temporary sh stoppage of something or the other, mm -hmm. generally speaking, India's evolution is in the hands of a bunch of very, very smart people by the millions. And, uh, uh, and interestingly, software is playing a massive role in that. I mean, to think that 200 million or so people already have Aadhaar identities, and pretty much everybody in India will have it shortly, within the next few years, um, it's an extraordinary benefit. Mm -hmm. And the possibilities of providing 
software services and capabilities to these more than a billion people are, are, are amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're listening to your career and, and the things that you've achieved in your life. I mean, you're, you're the kind of person who um, inspired me to, to write um, a book about the role of uh, the, the global Indians and the global Chinese and their contributions to spreading ideas and trade around the world, which uh, anyone can buy near the uh, exit if they want to after this. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to say is, um, Thank you. I think we're out of time. Um, thank you very much indeed for your comments. I think everyone enjoyed it very much. And I'm hoping that you could all join me in, in a round of applause uh, for our very special guest, Mr. Vishal Sikha. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You. And I have read your book. It is, it is fascinating. Vish told me about it. So Excellent. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you.